I'm Jane Collini from Garrison Institute, and I'm here with Robert Chodo Campbell and Koshin Paley Ellison, Zen priests in the Soto Zen Buddhist lineage who founded the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care in 2007, the first Buddhist organization to offer fully accredited chaplaincy training in America. The Zen Center's work is grounded in Zen meditation practice, and their education programs have grown into offering medical education and a master's in Buddhist studies. The Zen Center partners with leading medical centers and medical schools, including Mount Sinai, Beth Israel, New York Presbyterian, and the University of Arizona's Medical School. Chodo and Koshin are visionary leaders whose public programs have introduced thousands to the practices of mindfulness and compassionate care of both the living and the dying. So um, Koshin and Chodo, welcome to Garrison Institute. In your personal experience, how has contemplative practice translated into contemplative care? Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. Well, that's a it's a that's a tough one, and it, it's very easy. I mean, there's, I think there's no difference between care and practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're practicing care, hopefully, all the time. Mm -hmm. And when we're caring, we're practicing. Mm -hmm. the The secret, or rather, the recipe, the menu, is to find your own contemplative practice, whether it's meditation or whether it's yoga. For us. It's our meditation practice mm -hmm. from which I think we're informed. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that to me it's the way contemplative practice becomes contemplative care when we're actually speaking and functioning in the world in a way that is with our breath, with our ethics, mm -hmm. with our compassion, mm -hmm. with our ability to realize how we're talking and how we're functioning actually is, there's no separation. And I think also there's this emphasis in our culture of this idea of self-care. And one of the things in our work is really, by grounding it in contemplative practice, is really looking at the non-duality in order to care in a contemplative way is to care for yourself and the world and there's no separation. What is the fundamental basis of your approach to contemplative care and how does that translate into medical settings? Mm -hmm. Our fundamental approach is that things are fresh and new and you know it's so important in the Zen teachings about the really to be fresh like a dewdrop you know, to the value of a dewdrop because it never lasts for very long. So I think it's really to have that freshness when we're walking and talking to someone or walking down the hall or whatever it is. And so to translate into a medical setting, and I think that one of the ways that we've heard is like the one of the people in charge of oncology in one of the hospitals we work with talks about he almost like recorded, you know, some of the sutras because he said, you know, when we see your folks coming down the hall, they are really there. Mm -hmm. And so when they're walking, they're walking. And when they're with a patient, they're totally with a patient. Um, so there's that freshness. Mm -hmm. And of course we fail constantly, but we fall down seven times and get up eight times. And I think it's been through just showing how, instead of talking about Buddhism, talking about contemplative care, we're showing our practice by how we're functioning in the world, mm -hmm. by not harming others, by not um, causing division. Um, and I think that has been actually our most effective way of working in this wonderful mainstream medical world that needs care just like anywhere else. Yeah, I, so I think what you're saying is, is that, um, or rather what we do, I hope we do, is, is to model that fundamental approach. So constantly coming back to this moment, to not um, having an agenda, to not having a fixed idea about 
the situation ahead of us, how it's going to roll out, or a fixed idea of what should happen in this situation, whether it's in a patient's room or whether it's with a family member. Because we don't know each situation is unique upon, unto itself. And so what we try to instill, particularly in our students, is that you know what? You don't know. You won't know until the moment arises, and then how, through skillful means, will you uh, impart the wisdom of the teachings and your understanding of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, um, just to say a bit more, it's like working with our, you know, our Zen students or our chaplaincy students. In some ways, it's the same kind of way. It's about really seeing where there's a separation and helping each of us to see where we separate, mm -hmm. where we see something pure and where we see something impure, mm -hmm. where we see like, ooh, I'm holy and important and special and you're not. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, a, you know, it's always about bringing our awareness to and receptivity and vulnerability, I think. Mm -hmm. What has been your most cl uh, powerful clinical experience in the field? Well, the one that comes to mind that has stayed with me for, for a long time uh, is um, it was the case of, I'll change the names, um, Ernesto and Maria. And Ernesto had been on the oncology floor for a number of weeks, and actually for months, in and out, in and out. And when I received the referral from the nurse manager, he had been on the floor this visit for about three weeks. He was end stage, and he was not going to be go home, going home. Um, he would either die on the unit, or the hope was that he would go down to hospice. And the difficulty was that his wife, Maria, um, was in denial, we'll say denial. Um, she couldn't comprehend that actually this husband of 50 years or so was going to die. So she couldn't take it on. And so the, my, on my first visit to them, you know, I introduced myself as the chaplain on the floor, and um, for whatever reason, Maria saw me as a priest, a Catholic priest, because I'm in black and white, and she said, hello, Father, and it's great that you're here, and we're Catholic, and this is my husband, Ernesto, and he's crazy. And I was like, oh, why is he crazy? <laughs> she said, well, you know, he keeps having these silly ideas about what's going to happen, and that he's not going to go home, and uh, that he's going to, you know, he's failing. And I said, well, you know, what, is, what have the nurses told you? She said, I don't listen to the nurses. I know we're going home. And I said, OK, well, let's have a chat. So we talked for a while. She was very much in charge of the whole situation, constantly fussing with Ernesto and wiping his face and straight in the bed. And Ernesto was actually very beautifully just sitting, watching, and taking it all in. And I said to him, Ernesto, so what are your dreams and desires? What would you like? And he said, well, I want to go home and sit in the garden with my father. And for me, that was a very profound moment, because we always talk about what's the story underneath the story we're being told. So for me, immediately I got what, was, what he was saying. So he said, I want to go home and sit in the garden with my father. Maria jumps in and said, you see, he's crazy. We don't have a garden, and his father's dead. His father's been dead 20 years. But for me, what Ernesto was saying is, I want to die. Mm -hmm. I want to go home. I want to be with Jesus in the, in the garden. About three or four days later, um, after spending many hours with Ernesto and Maria, we finally convinced her to take him down to the hospice unit. And even at this point, she was still having none of it. She was 
thinking that he was going to go down. It was more like a rehab unit, and he would be going home eventually. Now, Maria had been sitting with him for weeks, day and night, sleeping there in, in the room, never leaving his side. And this is a, um, an old story or a very common story, particularly in hospice set settings. The evening before he died, Ernesto said to Maria, could you go home and bring some CDs that we can listen to, our favorite CDs? And he had a private room, and she said, yes, will you be OK? And he said, yes, the nurses are fabulous, and Chodo's going to visit, and we'll be OK. So Maria went home. Let's say it was a Tuesday night. On Wednesday morning, I am the first to arrive uh, to visit with him. And he's sitting just as you are right now, at, out, not in the bed, in the chair. And uh, I said, how are you doing? And he was eating his breakfast. And uh, he said, I'm going to die. And I said, I know. You're going to die. And that's why you're here in hospice, and we're taking great care of you. And he said, no, I'm going to die. And I looked. And suddenly he started to, um, just a little blood coming out of his mouth. He called, you know, pressed the emergency button. The nurse came in, the doctor came in. We got him into, off the chair, into his bed, lay him down. And he looked at me and he said, tell Maria I love her. And he died. And it was so shocking and so ordinary at the same time, that this man knew the precise moment almost when he was going to die. And he was so graceful. And he wanted to save Maria the heartbreak of being there with him when this happened. And at that moment, we, there was, I remember there, was, there were two nurses and the doctor. The doctor you know, pronounced him dead and then proceeded to leave the room. And I said to him, where are you going? And he looked at me, he was kind of shocked. He said, well, I've pronounced his dead. I said, you cannot leave this room until we've said a prayer. Knowing that Ernesto was a Catholic, very devout, and this would be very important to him. And so we said a prayer, and then the nurse was there, and we all held hands, and we held on to Ernesto. And the doctor actually began to cry. And he said, I will never leave a room again until I've made sure that we need to say a prayer or not. And thank you. And that was, for me, one of the most profound moments of bearing witness to the passing of this wonderful man and also bringing the doctor into the moment of this is a really sacred moment. You cannot leave until it's time to leave. That was it. Hmm? So the most powerful, I think, to me is there's so many. You know, yeah. It's impossible for me to actually name one that they all touch me in such different powerful ways. Um, and I think that to me is like the more I can be intimate in the moment, they actually, the power is there. Mm -hmm. um, one story, though, that pops to my mind and stays with me is I was called in the middle of the night to the emergency room, and there was a family who requested uh, spiritual care. And so I went, I think it was like 3 in the morning or something like that, it was, um, to the emergency room. and. I was ushered into this curtained area, and there was this whole family, um, all like lined up against the curtain. And there was this old, elderly, beautiful man in the bed. And when I got in, I was like, you know, introduced myself and um, said, you know, what kind of what. How can I help? What do you need? And they just all kind of pointed at their father and they're like, he's, he's dying and we don't know what to do. It was so powerful because they were literally like against the wall. I mean, it was a curtain, but they were, there was 
-hmm. about six of them. Mm -hmm. It was the, the wife, um, their children, and two of the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And they're all, you know, against the wall, as far away from this man. And I could see that his lips were moving. I said, well, what is he saying? And they said, we don't know. And uh, it was so powerful. That image of the people against the wall as far as they can, um, I think in some ways is why I do this work. Um, so I went over and introduced myself to him and um, called him Stanley. And he um, just kept repeating something. And it was very, very soft, like a whisper. And what he was whispering was, hold me, hold me, hold me, again and again and again. And it was so powerful. And I said, just hang on for a second, and told the family that that's what he was asking for. And they said, will you do it? They were scared to touch death. And I said, well, I'll do it if you, you know, hang on to me. I was trying to bring them into relationship um, with him. And so I went and held his hand. And then he said, more, more. And so eventually I was, you know, cradling him, and with the family linked to me, tethered um, to me, um, as he died. And to me, this story, um, and when he died, uh, you, you could feel it, right? When Stanley went, you know, I was embracing him. and. Uh, and the family, I asked them if they wanted to say goodbye to him, and they said, no, that was good, you know. And they went back to the curtain. Um, they went back to their fear. Um, and to me, you know, it was a huge, um, what Stanley, you know, still teaches me, is about how rare it is that we actually pay attention, that we actually listen to what someone else is saying, that we're so afraid to get close, um, to be intimate, to be vulnerable. Um, you know, I've had other experiences where it's you know, been more dynamic, but this is a story that stays with me and is a haunting tale for any relationship, you know, about this kind of holding back of intimacy. And when we let our fears come true. So but I think it's a, I think it's important to 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 say here too that the the retreating in fear is not wrong no. or right. It's just what, is. what was occurring for that family in that moment. And we're not all able to be with death. Right. And we have to really honor that. Mm -hmm. So here's a family that were really afraid of this man that they loved very, very much. Koshin told me the story afterwards. But they just could not be with him in that moment. So there's no judgment here at all. It's right. just that he was you know, just a beautiful man that wanted to be held. So Koshin was able to provide that. But. Yeah, that's a, that's just such a beautiful story. Thank you, and it illustrates the importance of storytelling and mm -hmm. intimacy in palliative care. And I wondered if maybe you could say a few words about your relationship to Garrison. I know you do programs in palliative care and meditation, and also I believe the symposium that is coming up and. 2014 is focused on these these very themes that you're addressing. So maybe you could speak to that. Well, we held our first 
Palliative and End of Life Care Symposium here at Garrison in 2012. And uh, it was such a huge success. This is the first time, to our knowledge, that this has been done anywhere. What we wanted to do was bring um, Buddhist practitioners, nurses, doctors, caregivers, and students into dialogue. And we were really overwhelmed by the response that we got from across the country and out of the country, people who um, in 2012, because it was new and we were, you know, we were really kind of pulling it together, not knowing how to do this, you know, Garrison, our organization, really pulled this together so beautifully, but in a, in a short amount of time, that people from across the, country, across the world were saying, we'd love to come to the next one. Please keep us informed. And as I said, it was such a, a success that we're doing it again next year in 2014, so we're planning it much more further in advance. Um, and as you said, these stories are so important because we all have stories. We have stories from our pers perspective as chaplains, as caregivers. The doctors have their stories and the surgeons have their stories. And the one, the common theme around the symposium anyway was how do we approach our profession from a contemplative standpoint? How do we introduce, if you like, the Buddhist teachings into our work and into the workplace? Right, and one of the beautiful things about collaborating with Garrison is it's such an incredible organization and the actual place is a place of retreat. And so one of the reasons why we were, it felt like the synergy of putting the symposium together of Buddhist contemplative practice end of life is this is the place to do it because we didn't want to do a regular conference. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was so wonderful about it is that it was like a retreat mm -hmm. for everyone, including the keynote speakers and the workshop leaders and the all incredible people from, who work in this field, including volunteers and yogis and the whole gamut, um, really felt nourished by their time here because we ate together, meditated together, um, learned together in a community. And that was the most general one. And the next one in 2014 will be focused on uh, communication and intimacy. Because it's really the heart of what gets broken in healthcare, um, is when the, we take away the intimacy of a moment of walking into someone's bedroom and realize that we're touching someone, that we're talking to someone at a moment that really matters. Mm -hmm. So it's that ability to really be present mm -hmm. and intimate. intimate. We say, you know, one of the, our, that we say often is that one can only be intimate with another as one can be with oneself, which is really at the foundation, I think, of the, um, the next symposium is how intimate are you allowing yourself to be with yourself? Mm -hmm. And how does that transfer into your work, mm -hmm. into your caregiving, into your surgery? Are you really, really aware of what's happening in you at the moment mm -hmm. of real importance? As Koshin said, when you touch the patient, it's coming from a place of real deep intimacy within me that knows it's me. I'm authentic. I want to connect to this patient. It's not just, how are you doing today? It's a very different touch. It's like, how are you? What's going on? I think that's the intimacy we try to find. And this is what we're, the kind of world we're cultivating. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank that's you. wonderful. Thank you. We all look forward to the symposium in 2014. As yes. do we. Yeah. Thank you.